thank you very much for uh, preferring me over the barbecues. <laughs> So we have this uh, approach called trusted execution, which I'm here to tell you about. And uh, it's a little bit of a journey I started many, many years ago. And you'll see how uh, this journey began. And uh, the goal was, you know, it started out in about 2006-ish kind of time frame. And then, uh, you know, we were sitting, a friend of mine who's actually a professor at uh, UMass in Amherst, uh, he and I were sitting in uh, Starbucks and uh, actually uh, working this over a napkin, literally. And uh, the idea was that you know we saw this uh, McAfee slammer worm take down millions and millions of PCs. Uh, uh, you know, every hour the number was growing, and uh, you know McAfee was putting out signatures, and the slammer worm was taking down more PCs. So there was a whole behavioral approach uh, that got me very intrigued. You know, this is all being done incorrectly. That was uh, you know our conclusion between the professor, friend of mine, and uh, myself. So we wanted to get to a more deterministic way that, you know, uh, how do we able to stop these, all these things at a uh, more fundamental level? And that uh, gave birth to this trusted execution technology. So if you look at the current landscape, you know, there are these uh, very advanced forms of attackers who kind of mount um, very sophisticated memory-based attacks, you know, this kind that, uh, that we're calling, they'll start off with uh, deep reconnaissance and uh, They'll go and infiltrate uh, web servers with zero-day exploits that are uh, kind of privy to nation states and cyber criminals and all. And what they'll do is they'll go through each of these phases, these stages and all. And then finally, uh, the idea here is that they'll infiltrate a particular server. They'll find a memory corruption vulnerability. They'll infiltrate. Now they live inside that particular process's memory. And they keep on pivoting to the next server and the next server and so on. So until they find somebody who has administrative privileges. And that's the key uh, to success now. Now you can access the databases with some administrative privilege accounts out there. A lot of these uh, script kiddies, uh, you know, who will, uh, uh, who take on from, they'll, they'll use things like, uh, you know, phishing toolkits and stuff like that. They'll try, spray their uh, tools around, somebody clicks, and, you know, it's like left to chance out there. You know, if you don't click on that, then you kind of, you know, you're not exposed. But as opposed to that, the cyber criminals that come in at the most sophisticated layer, they're kind of, uh, using techniques that don't fail. You know, if you put up a vulnerable Apache server, they can get into it, they can live in there, they can come and go as they please, they'll create a connection back to their command control center. And um, that's, uh, you know, at that point, you know, you can, because all the firewall holes on the, you know, on the other servers may be open to receive traffic from this particular server, they can traverse from one point to the other, to the other, and so on. So, so it's just a matter of time before you kind of uh, get breached. So we see this is a typical phishing attack. Um, you know, the attacker sends some phishing uh, mail or, you know, expects you to be able to click on that. Once you do, there's some malware that gets downloaded on your machine. It uh, starts um, um, uh, sniffing your password and you, all your keystrokes and things like that. And over a period of time, it will find what it's looking for, which is credentials. And then at that point in time, the hacker is uh, the bad guy out there is basically able to get steal all kinds of data that you have access to. So this is a very typical phishing attack. Uh, as opposed to that, uh, you know, the very advanced, uh, sophisticated attacker, what they're trying to do is they use scanning tools to go drop some, uh, you know, find something vulnerable, then they'll go and drop some shell code on it. Uh, let's say you have an Apache 2.2.2, which is known to be vulnerable. They'll go drop some shell code on it. This shell code basically lets them come in and out, as we talked about earlier. And then uh, because they're going in from the inside of the network to the outside, it's very hard to detect, especially if they're using ports like uh, port 80 or 443, which are traditionally where traffic goes from. They'll establish uh, connectivity with their command control center. Then they'll start pivoting. They'll drop as they find more stuff that they can attack. They'll go and drop uh, the shell code on uh, some administrator's uh, machine. And then this uh, shell code will go and start sniffing uh, passwords. And once they have uh, established connectivity, they can bring back uh, key loggers and, uh, you know, uh, password encryption, decryption tools and things like those rainbow tables, uh, something that can be used to crack uh, password. And then uh, they go back to the database, start establishing connectivity because they now have the admin privileges. Uh, and they start sniffing the data, slowly update, uh, you know, their own command control center. Uh, many of these command control centers have been known to uh, be alive for years and years. So they'll send data in dribs and drabs so it doesn't get uh, caught by the, you know, uh, sniffing tools, IDSs, IPSs and all. 
doesn't uh, sort of uh, you know uh, move the needle on uh, many of those thresholds and all. And then uh, you know once they've got enough uh, data, they start selling and monetizing this. Um, that's the typical advanced hacker, uh, you know, advanced um, uh, criminal kind of a, uh, methodology, as opposed to the previous one that we saw that was more targeted at um, uh, script kiddies. You know, script kiddies are able to do a lot less than what these guys are able to do. So if you look at it, uh, you know, what the script kiddies are doing is they're looking at, you know, well-known uh, exploits that are published, uh, you know, various places on the web. I can't name them. But you know, they just simply go and draw those, um, uh, kind of go and explore. If they find uh, they turn lucky, they'll go and start uh, you know, uh, exploiting the server, uh, either a laptop or a web uh, server in the data center. And then uh, you know, uh, the organized criminals actually do a little bit better than that. They'll actually go and uh, exploit uh, web servers which have uh, vulnerabilities in them. And then they, from that point on, they can start pivoting. The nation states uh, are, uh, you know, you've all heard of uh, Stuxnet, for instance, right? They strung a whole bunch of uh, code out there that they attacked a whole bunch of servers, and together they were able to sort of fool the uh, HMIs into believing that the turbines were spinning at a lot less speed than they were actually spinning at. So there was a dissonance between what the, uh, the presentation layer was showing and what the actual, what the IOs were doing. So those are the kind of uh, very complex attacks that these uh, nation states will mount. So if you look at, um, you know, this is a slide that was presented by Microsoft in the RSA 2015 conference. They did, uh, they traced back into 102 of those attacks that they thought were the most vicious attacks uh, that were mounted since uh, 2012. And out of those 102, what we saw is 100 of them used this uh, technique called ROP. Are you guys familiar with, anybody familiar with ROP, uh, Return Oriented Programming? So uh, for those who are not, you know, it's a very uh, clever technique. You know, you don't need any files to be dropped on the machine that you're targeting. You basically string the exploit code out of existing code that is genuinely loaded. You know, uh, OS libraries, runtime libraries and all. You can find enough tools, enough um, uh, what are called ROP uh, gadgets and instruction followed by a return uh, code. So if you string them all together, you can construct any malware out of all of this. So it's, uh, there's no need to put any malware in at all. So a lot of these uh, tools that we talk about today, you know, anti-malware devices and all, be completely blissfully aware, unaware of all of this stuff because there's no file to be transmitted anymore. So uh, this is a very vicious form of attack, um, you know, that the nation states and these uh, cyber criminals, are, the advanced cyber criminals are using. And it's like a 99%, uh, you know, uh, take rate out here. You know, Microsoft talks about how this has become like the dominant uh, vector that the most advanced criminals are using. And um, this is a research paper that's the research information put out by Gartner. If you look at those graphs out there, what we see is, you know, it's uh, used to be that the networks uh, were being attacked, you know, denial of services and, you know, you kind of flood the network with, uh, you know, try to reduce the availability of those servers. But now what we are seeing is uh, people are attacking uh, the application itself. And not only the application, but the instance. So those are the two biggest uh, attack vectors out there. So th by instance, I mean, uh, you know, things like, you know, you've misconfigured a particular uh, application server, an Apache, uh, you know, the very common uh, mistake people make is Apache, when you download it, it comes with a bunch of examples. There's a whole bunch of vulnerable code sitting in those examples. So if you don't remove those, uh, you know, you're now automatically made yourself vulnerable. So, um, so it's all about you know being able to tightly monitor how your application is running, and this is a, you know kind of indicator. This is of you know what the cyber criminal, the nation states, um, and the bigger cyber criminal, the smarter criminals are using. So, uh, as I mentioned before, I started a while ago, and uh, so one of the things that uh, my professor colleague and I did is that we went into the national vulnerability database and tried to figure out you know. What is it that now, you know, makes, uh, uh, what, what's in an exploit that's kind of unique uh, to a given exploit? So what we found is that there are these 23 different categories that are listed in uh, the National Vulnerability Database. And, uh, you know, not surprisingly, there's one at the bottom out here, the buffer errors, which is the uh, starting point for uh, most of these advanced attacks. So you have a vulnerability, then, you know, you can expect it to get attacked and all. But there are these other uh, uh, types of vulnerabilities out here. If we kind of uh, break it down, we'll see that they are uh, broadly organized in the, these four classes uh, of uh, problems here. 
So, um, so all of those 23 categories boil down to these four main approaches out here. What's going on out there? The memory attack. So the idea here is that you have a memory-based vulnerability. The hacker comes in, exploits it. Now they can take a trample. They can trampoline out of that code and go wherever they please. So this is the power of the buffer error. So it basically allows you to escape the jail of the application and start pivoting to other places that you want your own. You can. You have the ability now to run your own code. So that's what happens in memory-based attacks. So there's two kinds. You can use the ROP chain kind of method that I talked about, where you don't even have to drop a file, malicious content and all. But here in this, uh, the, the more typical case is that you drop a file through a SQL injection, or you kind of uh, make, uh, you have a phishing kind of an experience for that person, so they'll um, you know, download some stuff willingly on that particular machine. But that doesn't happen on servers. On these high endpoints, what happens is more SQL injection kind of vulnerabilities or these buffer type vulnerabilities. You can use that to establish connection back to the command control center and then do a lot of things. You can download, uh, you know, you can have a sort of a terminal session on that particular application as a result. And now you can download a whole bunch of uh, really bad things on that particular machine. So that's what the memory attacks are about. Then there's these data borne attacks. These are uh, what makes uh, these OWASP top 10 kind of uh, uh, headlines. So you know there's nothing wrong with the application. The application is still executing the right way, as opposed to the first one where the application was not executing the right way. It was letting some other piece of code come in and start executing. In this case, you know the data that the user is sending kind of goes and uh, meets a sort of an interpreter, a SQL interpreter, or a JavaScript interpreter, or LDAP and XML interpreter, and starts doing malicious things out there. So it's kind of uh, leveraging some vulnerability out there to, you know, in the application, so that you know that uh, application forwards that data to the interpreter, and that interpreter starts doing bad. You know, together with that, uh, so a SQL injection is a very good example of this. So, go ahead. Yes. So we saw in the previous slide there was buffer errors uh, that we saw vulnerabilities. So we can show you. We are going to be showing you some of those uh, in a demo soon. But the idea is that you know, once if you think of a vulnerable stack, uh, which has uh, you know, if I could flood that stack, I could go and change the return pointer on that uh, on the stack. Now when I get out of that, when that particular function exits, I'll go to where I choose, as opposed to where the uh, application wanted me to go to. Yes. Yes. Right. 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 The data is the means of facilitating that attack. It's not the real attack. You know, as opposed to a SQL injection, where you know I could uh, classical example where username and password I could add a or one is equal to one out there. So that or one is in, uh, equal to one goes and gets combined with uh, the rest of the SQL statement and starts executing. As far as the application is concerned, it did all the right things. You know, it called the function and it actually executed the SQL, sent the response back and all. So there's no, uh, you know, no foreign piece of code that executed out there. As opposed to the first ca category where, you know, some foreign code that's not part of the application's own DNA started executing. Number three was you know, this classical problem of being able to steal credentials. You know, the whole goal of uh, uh, most of these attacks, these phishing attacks, and these all these attacks is to steal credentials so that you know I can log in as some privileged user and start uh, taking data out that would normally not be available to me. And then there's these file-based attacks where the attacker kind of deposits not uh, uh, you know uh, not uh, shell code into the application, but you know is successfully able to make uh, some file get installed and then come back and uh, start uh, new threads with that particular uh, malicious content and all. So those we boil it down to the, the NVD charts to these four broad categories. Many of those attacks that you see in the NVD charts are uh, variants of these four classes essentially. So if you go back and look at um, uh, what's going on, the cyber criminals are basically kind of uh, targeting both the layers. If you think of a web application, it has two layers. Uh, pretty much, you know, you could think of it, these are the binaries, everything that's below the JVM or below the CLR, all the binaries that uh, facilitate transport of all the data, SSL, DNS, uh, HTTP, and all a whole bunch of um, stuff that is written in, um, uh, you know, compiled languages like C, C++, and all. So those are the binaries, they are the underpinning of a web application. On top of those uh, run uh, what we call the interpreted code. Uh, so you come and drop your jar files into a Tomcat container or a JBoss and container and so on. So the script kiddies are typically attempting to focus on uh, the upper parts of this uh, uh, equation out here. 
whereas the nation state or the cyber criminals are attacking both those layers. And it turns out that you know these cyber these uh, uh, binaries are the biggest source of problems. If you go back uh, looking at the last ten years, the ten most vicious attacks that have happened: Heartbleed, um, you know, uh, Glipsy. All of these are examples of uh, you know lower layers being attacked out there. So, uh, so we, uh, you know, we need to be able to. It's like having a uh, home with, uh, let's say, three doors, and you're kind of keeping door number two and three protected, but door number one is open. So, this is the idea that you know most. Uh, uh, that, that's very peculiar to us. We, we are the only company that can protect all the layers, as opposed to the other, uh, uh, you know, uh, companies that are kind of protecting pretty much at the interpreted code level. So. If, we look at um, some of the malware uh, that has been going on since uh, 2011 kind of time frame. We see the numbers of attacks have been going up, you know, dramatically. But if we go peel back and see, the, these are the number of exploits that have taken place. Uh, but if you look at the number of uh, vulnerabilities that have been leveraged out there, there's relatively small numbers. So it's, um, you know, you could go chasing after the uh, exploits or you could go chasing after the vulnerabilities. So what we uh, did consciously, uh, my professor colleague and I, we went after the vulnerabilities rather than going and chasing after the exploits, which is what most of the industry seems to be doing. You know, they're looking at uh, some data that's coming over the network and trying to figure out, you know, if what this data is going to do ultimately to the application. So, so to give you a little bit of a flavor of what we do, if you think about uh, a typical application, it loads uh, some executable and its libraries in memory at different addresses in memory, right? So as the application starts executing, it uh, you know uh, the code meanders, function foo wants to call function bar, which might live somewhere else, and so on and so forth. So this is the path of the application, and it's a little bit. If you think about it, you know it's got very similar. Uh, uh, look and feel to a Google, uh, you know, a map that you would kind of put in an application, an address that you start off, and an end address, and Google will lay out a bunch of on ramps and off ramps for you. So if you kind of stick around on those Google paths, you'll find that you know you're not, uh, you'll get to your destination, uh, you know, without any uh, uh, issues and all. But let's assume for a moment some guy comes back and uh, a carjacker gets into your car, holds a gun, and tells you to go off to Florida, for instance, right? You have no choice, you know, you've got a gun held to your head. So you start driving, and so this is pretty much what the malware is also trying to do. Malware comes in and it uh, wants you to do something that's not application. It's a uh, totally different, um, you know, behavior that whatever the malware wants it, it to be able to accomplish. So uh, this is what, uh, you know, we are able to detect in very, very quickly because you're not uh, going down those uh, Google uh, laid, the, the maps that uh, Google kind of, uh, app, you know, something like Google laid out for you. So we are not uh, following the on ramps, off ramps that um, you know that the application is telling us. So what we do is we kind of create uh, when we look at the application, the binaries. We can actually ingest the binary as we are ingesting the binary as loading in memory. We can create those Google Map kind of uh, linkages uh, for ourselves. So now we know that the application has uh, let's say this function foo that calls function bar. Uh, we now know that you know at this particular address, wherever function foo loads and wherever function bar loads we'll be able to keep those transitions alive, you know. So a, a jump from uh, the address in uh, foo where, uh, you know, there's a call to bar uh, to the address for bar is a legal jump. It's like uh, Google map, you know, we're going on a, uh, you know, a set of uh, on ramps and off ramps. And so now we know that we are following the recipe that uh, the application laid out for us. As opposed to the malware which wants to meander around and uh, go uh, start establishing uh, you know, connectivity back to their command control center, they start doing things that are uh, very different from what the application wants to do. So if you look at this, um, you know, a typical um, application, uh, some user that's sitting out there, a whole bunch of users, uh, good guys, bad guys, are uh, sending data towards the application. So it kind of, the first data is being intercepted by some sort of a cloud gateway, maybe a web server which uh, ultimately sends off the traffic to uh, the application server that's going to ex uh, execute this particular instruction. So the first form of security that people ever put together out there was this traditional firewall. They kind of create segments inside your network so the server that were deeper inside the network wouldn't be exposed to uh, the malicious uh, users. And then, uh, you know, in the early uh, 2099 uh, kind of time frame, there was a whole bunch of companies uh, that came up and uh, started putting together IDSs and IPSs. 
And the idea was that you'd look at this data and figure out, you know, if the IP address uh, gave you some clues it's coming from some sort of a botnet or, you know, some bad uh, sources that have done bad things in the past. So you're using the data to figure out, you know, uh, if this is an attack or not. Then came these uh, much smarter companies called uh, Palo Alto, for instance. They look deeper on a session-aware basis. They'll go and look deeper inside the uh, network traffic and try to figure out if uh, there's bad thing coming over the pipe out here. So they could uh, see if there's a one is equal to one kind of a thing, or they could see some malicious um, um, attempt at you know some malware that is being sent out there. So they could do a lot more smarter things based on the data that they're seeing out there. And then uh, Fire, I put out this sandbox uh, solution where you know you could actually take some of your uh, uh, emails and uh, what they call explode those emails in a, a VM and see if bad things are happening out there. Um, a web application firewall. These uh, are slightly, uh, you know, they're uh, smarter forms of uh, uh, these traditional firewalls, but they look deeper and deeper inside the HTTP protocol. They can look at every form field and figure out if there are bad things coming in uh, from the form fields. Um, so here's, uh, you know, a bunch of things that when the data reaches the application server, um, there are these um, HIPs and NIPs kind of uh, solutions out there that look for, uh, you know, reputation-based uh, kind of uh, denial of service. So they'll see this data is coming from a, um, a known botnet, for instance. So they'd actually be able to intercept and uh, uh, reject that packet. Um, and then there's these RASP and uh, file white. I'll talk about the RASP a little bit later, but let's I'll talk a little bit about the file whitelisting solutions. So many of these, um, the goal is to restrict the number of processes that can be run on, this, uh, on that particular machine. But once they are done, uh, can the process be protected? Can I inject stuff into the process? And the answer is yes. A lot of people we saw in Stuxnet that that's what they did. So, you know, it's an incomplete solution in that sense. That anti-malware, there's two kinds of anti-malware that you might have seen. You know, the first wave that came from Symantec, McAfee and all were basically uh, velocity-based uh, malware. So, you know, you could see that uh, if a certain file shows up at 2,000 uh, different locations in a week, uh, that could be the threshold to declare that this particular uh, piece of uh, software is a uh, malware. But um, this kind of um, uh, got defeated by, you know, these micro, um, uh, uh, micro propagation mechanism where, you know, a very targeted attack against a single organization doesn't spread into thousands and thousands of these machines and all. Those would not get trapped by this velocity-based mechanism. So companies like Silence came over and they said, uh, you know, instead of taking a file, a lot of people started doing this, you know, they take a big malicious uh, content, chop it up into small pieces, and then they deliver this into, uh, you know, to the end point, wherever they're going to infect in small pieces. Now, if you look at individual pieces, there's nothing out there, you know, the fire eyes of the world would kind of completely get fooled by that. So what um, uh, Silence and companies like those did, they took, uh, you know, smaller chunks uh, of the big file, and they sort of created these little signatures, um, you know, where's the first call statement, how far away it is from the beginning of the file and all. So, so by doing that, they can recognize if you are sending chunks of uh, files as opposed to the whole file. So this was a little bit better kind of a thing. They were waiting for bad things to happen rather than a velocity-based approach, which is, you know, how many times this file has been found, uh, you know, at such and such location. So the problem with all of these approaches is uh, if you look at um, uh, the uh, basic shortcoming is that all they have is this data that's uh, coming in over the network. They have to sort of extrapolate from this data. Is this data going to do bad things to the application or not? That's the problem that they're trying to solve. So it's like, you know, uh, we're sitting here, we're having this conversation here, but out on the road, out there somewhere, somebody is driving by and they're trying to figure out what's going on in this particular room. You have to make a guess, you know, we see a whole bunch of people coming in, there must be something going on inside out here, there's, it's the, say the word LASCON, maybe there's a LASCON conference, there's only so much inference you can draw out of all of that stuff. So the big change that we instituted was, you know, we kind of want to be in here. We want to see what uh, all this data does. It's no, there's no point in tracking the data, it's like trying to, cop, uh, trying to count the drops of water in the ocean. You know, you'll all, always, the answer will be, you know, sometimes it'll be right and most times it'll be wrong. This is what results in these false positives. So we said we are going to watch, keep an eye on the application instead. Let's see if the application is doing the right thing or not. Does it continue to do the right thing or not? So that's the approach that we call trusted execution. We want to make sure the application is not affected by any of this activity that you know, the uh, good guys, bad guys want to be able to do on this particular application. So what that does is it basically helps us uh, get to a very efficacious uh, result here. 
we don't get fooled by you know some SQL injection attempts. If you look at a OWASP uh, result out there, you'll see it's inundated with uh, you know false positives and all. You, you know, a lot of these scanning tools will send you a whole bunch of things, and you're looking at it and saying, hmm, this is not a problem. You know, my application deals with it. So just because I can send a one is to one equal to one up to the application doesn't mean it's vulnerable. It didn't execute, but they have no way of looking at it because they don't have the granularity to go back to the SQL statement or look on the return path whether this uh, SQL executed or not. So you know, it's um, it's a big headache, and uh, you know, it takes a long time. You know, we found by our internal testing that many of these DAS tools have like 30, 40 percent efficacy. They'll be able to detect only like 30 percent of the attack. So how do we know that? If you look at um, you know the OWASP benchmark tests, you'll find if you run the standard tools against these uh, well-crafted attacks, you'll find there's an efficacy of like we found one particular tool that I can't name. It actually detected 89 out of the 272 pages that were actually uh, had vulnerabilities in them. So the idea is that you know we want uh, you know if you take this particular let's say you decided to take this application believing your SAS tool or your DAS tool did a great job and then you put it into production, it will generate a whole slew of noise out there in the data center and people will get uh, upset. The data center, the guys in the SOC will be inundated constantly with these false alarms and they'll come back and say, guys, you know, I'm going to switch this uh, dial back and ignore all of this stuff here. So this is a big difference. We actually end up with a very high efficacy. You'll see very soon, uh, you know, we'll be presenting some data on benchmark, how did we do out there? And we'll see, you know, we approach a near 100% uh, result. With the, on these OS benchmark tests and all. Eric, time for you to show your magic. So, currently we have volume to show that we have an application that is currently protected by our system. So we have a Microsoft SQL uh, server that we actually have protected. <coughs> Show you that this is kind of a normal state. Our application is sort of known to be protected. So now I'm going to actually be kind of a hacker or some type of automated program. I'm going to do a file drop. I'm going to detect that file drop on the particular sy file system that's being protected by the system. And then I'm going to execute sort of a syringe process to inject a DLL into the Microsoft uh, uh, SQL Server and see the reverse shell go back to my um, Kali box. So, showing my Kali box, I'm looking for any new sessions that will be appearing here. That system is currently running. Well, now I'll go to, I'll do a simple copy of a file, I'm doing a DLL drop, this, this DLL dot, bad DLL dot. DLL is what I'm going to syringe into that particular application. So I have a SQL Server that's currently running. Look at the Process Explorer. You can see all the different DLLs that are currently running that system. So the first thing we're going to do is just do a file drop into that particular file system. Do a simple copy. You'll notice that almost immediately I get the file integrity issue. So I detected that file drop, I can actually go into that particular pod to see actually what happened. <clears throat> so you see the file integrity. See that there's a new file that's been dropped into that particular system. The words located at. So now that I actually have the DLL, this could be a script, this could be someone else doing something remotely. Now I'm actually going to inject using the syringe program, I'm going to inject that DLL into that Microsoft SQL Server. So I need to know the PID ID of that, so 30, 3596. Shows that I successfully injected that DLL into that, which does a reverse shell into my Kali box. So going back to my system panel, you can see now that particular box is under attack. Right now, you can see that it was a buffer error that occurred. 
Now I can go to my Kali box, see that I actually have a session that has just been opened up to the system. So I can do a session. Now I'm on that box remotely. So that shows how quickly we can detect that type of uh, attack. So now I'm going to actually just run the benchmark. We have another application. This is going to be the last benchmark. We're just doing a subset of that benchmark. We have our own little fuzzer that's currently running on that system. So we have the last SQL injection test that we're going to be running. So there's 504 uh, tests in this suite that we're testing against. And I'll show you that this application is in its normal state. So the application is in its normal state. So now I'm going to go. So now I'm on the Kali box again. So I'm going to run the, actually this benchmark. In this benchmark, this little script that we created, we're going to randomly pick some payloads. So these are three random payloads that we're going to be injecting to the 504 uh, injection points, right? 274 of them are actually valid. So 272, sorry. Um, so I'm just going to run this program. running through that process. And it'll take a while, you see that we start getting an attack. So <coughs> we'll continue with the conversation and we'll show you the results at the very end. So, so um, if you look at um, the key value that um, uh, we bring to the table out there as compared to WAF, is that um, the detect detection precision you'll see soon out there will be, once the OS benchmark test run, is a lot higher than anybody in the industry can talk about. Um, so it's, in, uh, um, it's based on uh, uh, you know, a very fast uh, uh, regex operation that we do in our appliance. This appliance can be a software appliance or it could be a hardware appliance. The accuracy, there's we end up with uh, almost uh, zero. You'll see zero false positives out here. And uh, it can instrument any uh, application, whether it's a binary application or an interpreted application. We don't really care. We'll ingest the binary for anything. We'll uh, not just uh, you know known binaries, but uh, you know don't, we don't ask go around asking for sources for anything. Not just not for binary, not for your applications and all. And um, uh, the big idea here is that you know uh, it basically uh, our application will end up creating a, a, a sort of an app map like a Google map. Uh, that we will be able to uh, use to follow the application around. And f uh, when, when we see that there's a departure from this app map, we'll be able to detect that and tell you right away. And um, you know, we are very deeply instrumented. So there's a lot of people have asked us you know, about, uh, uh, can you give me uh, you know, a traditional, uh, uh, when you think of compliance, you, at, that, uh, at the time when you get attacked, uh, you know, you, the FBI comes in and they start looking for you know, logs in the web server, logs in the apps, uh, you know, web server, database server, and they start uh, pouring through it. A lot of uh, time and energy has to be spent to sort of correlate who came when and all that kind of thing. But in our case, we provide these uh, logistics for free, uh, you know, and uh, they get generated for right there, there at that point in time. So we know who the user is, what was the URL, what was the SQL they hit. Now imagine if you look at it from, a, uh, uh, from an engineer, from a remediation perspective, you know exactly which field was used by the uh, bad guys to be able to go and perform a SQL injection attack, for instance. So now it's very easy to remediate that particular uh, you know, vulnerability in your app. 
if you think about uh, it's it's all the power of the actionable information that is being generated by this application here so if you look at uh, you know the landscape of security is changing completely you know the older approaches the ideas ipss are disappearing and you know the way we see you know how things are uh, uh, shaping up you know um, it's um, companies like distill shape security are kind of uh, protecting at the network layer and um, uh, signal sciences who's right here uh, stealth security t cell ios who also right here uh, they kind of uh, go extend they deliver the ovac top 10 kind of protection whereas if you look at what versec does it's uh, across the spectrum it will de deliver uh, you know things that are extending right into your container into your uh, vms uh, into your ami and we protect the application com comprehensively not just a set a little bit of this little bit of that but you know you have to be able to keep your all the doors if you are kind of getting attacked it's no good to sort of keep only two doors out of your five doors uh, you know in your home uh, protected but to protect all of them so what does it mean uh, you know for development uh, team like all of us out here so a lot of time is spent and you know you kind of uh, make a build and release it and then you know you run these uh, dash dash tool they'll tell you partially your story then you come back to the drawing board then you keep going back again uh, you know it's an iterative cycle it takes months and months before the application can be released into production and all so with armas protection out there uh, you know you can start releasing uh, when you find a problem you can get it uh, remediated very very quickly because armas will tell you exactly which uh, field where exactly in your form uh, you manage to sort of uh, you know have uh, data uh, malicious data is sort of uh, infiltrated the application so um so the idea here is that uh, uh the uh, we basically we kind of eliminate this long window of time where people will have to sort of you know you keep uh, making releases then you come back and you make more releases to cover up whatever you found in the previous release and uh, you know it doesn't mean the dash sas tool basically are um, they'll produce like 30 40% efficiency so all you find out is about those 30 40 tools and all uh, problems in your code and today you know a situation is that you know the code keeps changing in the you know like company like facebook and all will drop uh, code new code uh, 20 30 times a day so how do you keep up with all of these learning that these vaf tools need to be able to uh, make if you think about a you know i i'm going to make a two part answer here there's the first part is for the binaries and the second part is for the um, uh, interpreted code so for binaries as we are kind of ingesting the application the app map gets created automatically you don't even have to touch it yeah for the you are for the interpreted code what we do is we you um, we take it into some sort of a staging area and then we fire some benign data you know every form field that we discover we stuff it you know if it's a var chart 20 then we basically you know stick every input every field has a characteristic that the w3 uh, school will tell you what it is so we stuff the data in it we fire it away and now we have a url and a sql link out there so now well at a functional level we are not trying to look at the code and trying to figure out because the code that's a losing argument because company like facebook will keep dropping new code on it it's like uh, you know it's a uh, you know you're always chasing the wrong thing there at that point so what we do is we take the url here's the url and here's the sql that it generates so now you know the uh, next question would be you know what about the new code that came in how do you characterize that one so what we do is we have the ability to inspect the urls at wire speeds at over 10 gigs per second you know uh, each of these appliances can do that and you could stick more appliances if you need more uh, throughput out there and then we look at every form field we'll uh, kind of uh, figure out you know is there sql statements in there are there sql expressions in there are there javascript uh, you know uh, hiding in there so so now we are able to be able to uh, uh, detect if the input is pristine or not and then that's not all that we do then we take this particular url and let's say this uh, URL triggers a SQL statement that says select star from table one where user is equal to Satya, Satya being my name. So uh, we, we strip out the Satya, take the rest of it, we call it the backbone of that SQL. Now this particular URL is tied to this backbone. This particular URL should cause a SQL of this particular nature. And then when we look at the SQL statement, we are able to conclude that you know, this URL is now causing a SQL statement uh, of a different nature. So this is when uh, part of our secret sauce, we pass on the context around so that we know even at the SQL server, we know who the user is. Normally the, at the SQL server, you don't get that context. What was the URL? What was the user behind it? And that makes for a great report at, uh, and, you know, for compliance purposes. You now know you have 
uh, everything in known in one place. This particular user made fired this URL that caused this particular SQL, and we have visibility into the return part. Did it execute or not? And then we can keep following. You know, one of the things that one of our customers told us is, I want to be able to create a footprint, uh, a complete, uh, you know, attribution for this uh, malicious person out there. So we can do that, or we could actually cut them off. We could say, you know, this guy is doing bad things. Let uh, lock them off. So there's a whole bunch of remediation thing that we could do, both at the binary layer and at the interpreted layer. So what we have is a probe that uh, is, that's the only thing that we are running inside the application. And the rest of it, uh, all the analysis is done in our own hardware. So the, one of the biggest problems that a lot of these companies have is that they'll start writing um, stuff in, they'll uh, have a plugin or you know, they're doing a lot of analysis and all. Those things kind of slow the application down. Whereas what we do is we take the data off, run it in our own appliances, come back. Um, and uh, some of those companies will basically try to uh, you know, do some uh, LangSec or some other clever technique out there, trying to see if this data that's coming in over the form field is, uh, has, contains uh, SQL or JavaScript or some similar artifacts out there. So they'll come back, they'll do a whole bunch of analysis, and they'll come back. It all, everything takes time. Right? So it's not really, you know, that's a tool that you cannot really stick in production where there's millions and millions of um, you know, transactions taking place out there. Maybe for a small, you know, uh, like a POC kind of a scenario, but not really for a very large operation. No, no, the appliance is not, yes, it's a software appliance, so it could be a hardware appliance, depending on what your requirements are. If it's a software appliance, like a AWS kind of instance, it could be sitting right next to wherever you, in your VPC. We don't want to touch any of this stuff. And by the way, this is a very nice platform-ish kind of an approach out there. It grows over time. You know, you can put, think of it as a snort, but not at the network layer, but at the application layer. You can create your own rules and you can, add more capabilities to this um, as you please. So this is a very nice uh, uh, thing for the community to be able to focus on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, instrumentation, yes. Yeah, so the way we kind of work is we kind of go tell our customers, you know, if you want the most out of your product, you want to know what vulnerabilities there are, uh, let's have our teams go in and do some uh, very smart pen testing. On it, so now we have uh, something that they value out there. Essentially, that you know, you found uh, maybe configuration like we saw instance problems in the earlier charts out there. So you can find application layer or instance related problems, and then you know we focus on those. Give a round of applause to Satya Gupta. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. <laughs>